Let's dive right in. This video will be a little more advanced and a bit different, so to save your time I've put timestamps in the description and the timeline. The very short version is, if you combine different particle systems with modifiers then you can control several aspects of animation. But for now we're going to get into the much longer version. I'm actually going to start by breaking down this animation and then discussing how the controls I used to create it could be extended to a wide variety of scientific animations. This particular project came after a discussion about how to animate proteins in a phospholipid bilayer but the approach could be used for all kinds of other studies. The original tutorial was designed around catalyst adsorption to surfaces but it works well for almost any kind of surface interaction. Proteins sitting on or interacting with membranes in biology, catalysis and chemistry, epitaxial growth modes in materials engineering, and just generally all kinds of other surface interactions. And if you combine this approach with some slightly more advanced shading tricks you can really communicate a message very clearly. So I'll show one of those off for fun at the end of this tutorial. But let's begin by breaking down the animation. I'm going to start off in solid view and you can see we have a phospholipid bilayer and a protein chain. I have a bunch of free styles of phospholipids available on Gumroad and tutorials for making and animating protein chains I'll link in the description for those interested. But in terms of this animation what I want is for the bilayer to be moving and for the protein to move with it. Now on the next pass what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to grab this plane and I'm going to enable a displacement modifier that I have down here. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to make it so that the protein will descend and land on the plane. Now with the modifier enabled we go ahead we play the animation and we can see the protein is actually going to descend onto the plane but the key thing is once it lands it's actually still going to continue moving with that wave so it'll go up and down. Now if I wanted I could also add a little bit of extra control so that the wave doesn't actually impact the descent of the protein but that requires a bit more work and some stylistic sacrifices that we're not going to get into in this video. So up to now we have a wave propagating across the bilayer and we have the protein animating so it descends onto the surface. Now we're going to actually make this a little bit more interesting by enabling yet another wave modifier. And this one, once it's enabled, is going to make it so that when the protein actually descends onto the surface it's actually going to create its own local effect. And this is really going to sell the impact that it is doing something and having an impact here. Finally, the last little change that I can make to this to really sell the effect is to simply come into a material preview or rendered mode so you can see what's actually happening with the shading. You can see that we have this very local little distortion in the color and if we reset the timeline all the way back and then actually come to the camera view we can finally see the full animation. So I'll go ahead and press play. We see the wave propagates across, the protein descends as the camera moves and we start to see this coloration appear and then it pulses in the region where the protein is impacted. And you can imagine how this could be used to tell a story about how a protein interacting with a bilayer in some capacity causes some sort of biological change for signaling or something else. Now other than changing the color, at the end most of this is actually just being driven by combining different particle systems, some tricks with object origin points, vertex groups, and then carefully arranging a modifier stack. So we're going to start a scene from scratch in Blender and I'll show how to get the simple effect of having an animated wave, though it could be anything, move across the plane and then control an object rising or falling onto that surface. We'll use a simple example of filling a vacancy on said surface. We've got our new scene in Blender and I'm going to quickly show this before starting from scratch and we'll actually go ahead and make this. So if I press play you can see this wave is undulating out and what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to control the strength of this displacement to bring the secondary atom either into place or out of place in terms of contacting the plane. And this is sort of the example that I mentioned with catalyst absorption. So let's go ahead start from a new scene in Blender and we'll break down every aspect of this in detail. So starting from scratch I'm going to go ahead grab the default cube hit X and delete it. From there I'll hit shift A add in a plane, tab into edit mode S and 5 to scale 5 times, right click subdivide and I'm going to subdivide a few times probably until just about here. Pressing shift R every time so that I can actually replicate the subdivision. You can also just change the number of subdivisions you want from this panel. From here I'm going to tab back into object mode and I'm going to very quickly add in two UV spheres. Right click shade smooth on both or actually rather I'll just make one, move it out to the side, shift D to duplicate and then move it out over here. I'd like to be able to distinguish these so I'm going to change their names and also add different colors. So we'll start by grabbing the first one and I'm going to call this base material or base surface. I'm then going to grab the second and I'll call this atom very simply. So this is going to be the atom that adsorbs onto this surface which will be made of these particles here. And we'll go ahead and we'll just add two different colors. Blue for the first and then just replicating what we had earlier a metallic silver. So that we can see what's happening in real time we'll come to material preview and here we go. 
Now, to get this effect to work, I'm going to grab the plane, tab into edit mode, come to the object data properties, and add a vertex group. I'm going to assign every vert that I have selected, which is simply all of them, by hitting A to select all, and then hitting assign. Now I'm also going to rename this group and call it Group A. What I want is for one of these verts to not be present in this group, so I'm going to hit Alt A to deselect everything, and then I'm going to choose this vert right here. I'm going to remove that from the selection, add a second vertex group called Group B, and I'm actually going to assign this vertice to that group, so we'll go ahead click Assign. To create our surface using our base surface and atom, I'm going to simply grab the plane, come to the particle properties, add in a hair particle system, and the exact number that I want for the first, for the blue ones, is going to be the number of vertices in this entire plane. So just A to select everything, and I can see I have 1089 minus 1, so 1088. From there, I'm going to change source to vertices. I'm going to use the modifier to stack, uncheck random order, change the render from path to object, select my base surface object, and then I'm going to come down and while I'm at it, I will uncheck show emitter in the render and the viewport. And then under vertex groups, I will choose density group A. And group A is going to place blue atoms or blue spheres everywhere except here. Now, very simply, I'm going to do the same thing for the silver one. But to save myself some time, I'm going to come up to the top, look at this little arrow, click it, and choose duplicate particle system. Why? Because it has all the settings that I want. So I'm going to check this or I'm going to grab this particle system first, check this little two, change this number to one, change the instance object to my atom, and then I'm going to change the vertex density group from group A to group B. And so you can see this is now filling in right here, and the rest are all blue. For the sake of argument, I'm also going to scale this just a little bit so it becomes a little bit more obvious that that is the atom we're working with. Now, if we were working with an object that had a specific geometry or asymmetry, like a protein or a phospholipid, we would want to enable rotation by coming to advanced and enabling rotation on both of these particle systems. And then, or at least on the ones that had an asymmetrical instance object. We would also then want to likely change this orientation axis, usually for something like this where it's facing up and down, you want to go with global Z. Since we're working with spheres, this isn't going to be an issue, but I thought it was something worth mentioning. Now, the trick to achieving the animation effects is controlling where this modifier stack is arranged. And so we have two particle systems that are nondescript right now. I'm going to rename them to base particles. And we'll call this one atom particle. The basic trick here is that where these appear in the modifier stack is going to impact which modifier applies to it. We can also use the vertex groups that we created to modify the actual modifiers themselves. For instance, let's start by adding a simple wave modifier. If we do that and press play, you can see that there's some sort of undulation. Because we've hidden the original plane, you can't see it. But if I take the wave and move it above just the atom particle, now the atom particle will move up and down. If I take it and I move it above both the base particles and the atom, then both of them will move together. Now, with this specific setup, I have no way of controlling how this atom is going to fall into place on the surface. The way I would do that is actually quite simple. I'm very simply going to come up to Add Modifier, Displace. I'm going to change the direction to Z drag it so that it is above the atom particle and below the base particle, right there. And then I can just control the strength and move it up and down. A strength of zero will place it right in the middle of the plane. Anything above that will move it up. I can also move it down below if I want. Now, because I've already chosen to have this be an empty spot, if I wanted to, I could also modify the wave so that it does not impact that specific vert. I can just choose a vertex group and I'll choose vert A. Now you can see this doesn't move at all, and I have free control over moving this up and down. Because I've also elected to do this with a vertex group, I could modify the displacement so it only impacts the vert at group B. And then I could have this above both particle systems and control it like this, and it's not impacting all of them. If I did not have vert B selected, you would see that I've actually controlled the whole thing moving it up and down. And so this gives you two layers of control. One is where the particle systems are relative to the modifiers, and the other is using the vertex groups, depending on how you want to arrange it. From here, we're going to quickly switch to another example for aligning positions of certain particles on planes. In this example, you can see that the actual plane driving all the animation is down here, in the middle of the bilayer. But this little surface protein that I have, I would like it to sit on top of the bilayer, not on top of the plane. Now, to offset that, it's actually pretty easy. I'm simply going to visualize the rock, which is the actual particle, and you can already see a bit of the trick here. 
This is the object origin point for this rock. Rather than being in the middle, it's all the way right here. If I grab the rock, right click, and choose set origin to geometry, you can now see that the rock has disappeared. That is because it has actually gone inside the plane. And to be able to view that, I would have to hide the particle system. So there is our little surface protein. Way too low. Very easy fix on that. Simply grab your rock, or protein, tab into edit mode, and then you're going to want to move it into the right direction. So in this case, I'm going to hit G, X, and then just move it up until it sits where I want it to on the plane. This is how you can easily impact the origin point by just moving the object in edit mode. The origin will stay wherever you left it. And so that solves that problem in case that is something that you were running it to. Finally, we're going to turn back to the original animation. To get the secondary wave, where the protein lands and then undulates outwards, I use the offset for the wave modifier, which you can find down here. To very simply get the positions for the offset, I simply grab the plane, tab into edit mode. I can see that this is the vert that I want. With it selected, I hit Shift S and then choose cursor to select it. I can then open the end menu, come to view, and I can actually see the dimensions of the cursor in X and Y. I copy those directly here, and this gives me the appropriate offsets for this actual wave modifier. As a note, if you don't actually remember which of the verts that you selected and you have a hard time telling from where the protein or other object is actually landing, you can simply come to your vertex groups and then by simply deselecting everything, you can select a vertex group and see which area it's impacting. So in this case, I want to know where the vert is. I'm going to grab the appropriate vertex group, hit select, and it's right there. Ideally, these would be named a little bit more clearly. Finally, to get the fall off the way I wanted, I simply adjusted this value until it stopped propagating pretty much to the extent that I want. I've also used a larger vertex group that you already saw to constrict the range. If I didn't have any fall off, then what we would see is it would just end abruptly on the corners here, and that doesn't look quite as good. For the local color change, this is a materials trick, and we're going to have to open the node editor for this. So I'm going to open a new window, come to the shader editor, and actually grab the phospholipid, because that is what's controlling the color of each of these positions. Now, this may seem like a little bit of an involved node, but actually most of the work is occurring right down here. And essentially, all I've done is added a texture coordinate node, chose an empty object, which is actually placed right there on the scene, underneath the area that I want to choose. I'm grabbing the object coordinates, putting them into a vector multiply, and then pumping that into a gradient texture, which is controlling the hue saturation value for the colors. And all that essentially means is that every single particle coming out of here is assigned a random value which chooses one of four colors that it can have. You can see those here. The hue is just going to control what the color actually ends up being. So it gives me an extra handle to work with. Now by changing the hue locally using this empty, I can actually just create a gradient around a spherical gradient, and that locally impacts the hue relative to the proximity of the empty. I can use the multiply factor here to control how big or small that is in the X, Y, and then by using the Z, I can actually use the empty positionally. So by having the empty at a higher or lower position, we're just going to grab that again. And if I scrub along the timeline here, you can see the empty is actually going to move down. So we'll hide the whole layer so you can actually see just the movement of the empty, which is right there. So as I scrub the timeline, the empty is moving up and down. These are simply location keyframes that I've set. So I choose the starting place, grab it, hit I and add a location keyframe. Then I move it into place where I want to be and then add another location keyframe. And you can see I have three here just to really slow that effect down and control it a bit more. Now, when the plane is actually in view, what that means is as the empty drops down, there's nothing present. And then based on, again, this setup of nodes, when the empty comes up into proximity based on the vectors, you can see it's going to start creating a change in the hue right there. And if we were to actually just visualize this, so I have node wrangler enabled, I'm gonna hit control shift and left click then I can actually see this effect spreading out. And this is where the change in the hue is going to come because it's actually going to give me a value between zero and one for the factor. I can actually just use that directly into the hue, which goes from a value of zero to one anyway, usually, and that will let me control this fall off and locally change the color. So as I mentioned, if I want to, I could drop these values to about 0.2 and 0.2. That would give me a much bigger effect, or I could make them even smaller and of course, if I wanted to, I could have them be oblong. They don't have to be quite so local. So from here, we'll just visualize that again. And that's just a simple way of getting that trick to occur and really selling this effect a little bit more. Now, this has been a much longer tutorial than usual because I think this approach is actually quite versatile and it didn't really make sense to me to package it into individual tutorials on some of the subjects I mentioned at the beginning. I strongly encourage exploring this yourself. 
Ultimately, I do think geometry nodes are going to provide a better way to achieve this effect, but there's something I'm still exploring, and I generally don't make tutorials on things that are in the alpha or beta releases in Blender. Usually it has to be in a stable version before I'll put it out there. In the meantime, this approach generally works for all kinds of different animation effects. It's something I'd like to cover in more detail on the channel as we move forward. It is a little bit more challenging, so if you stuck it out to the end, thanks for coming out. If you found this helpful, consider subscribing, sharing with your friends and colleagues. Until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.